Good evening. My name is Pastor Jeremy Shines, and this is Midnight Bible Study. It's just going to say Bible Study because sometimes I'll do it in the morning, sometimes I'll do it in the afternoon, but for the most part, I'm doing it at night because I have kids. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for another day. Bless us, forgive us of our sins, help us move forward and let go of any weight that tries to hold us back, our past or people or any stumbling blocks, whether it comes from others or the spiritual realm or whether we put it in our in our path itself. Father, remove every stumbling block, breathe through us and help us understand your word. In Jesus name, amen. So let's get to it. We left off at John chapter one, verse 43. Philip and Nathaniel. Philip and Nathaniel. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, follow me. So Jesus is saying to the disciples, follow me. It's interesting because I find this interesting because uh, Jesus is God. And when God speaks, it happens. Think about that. When God speaks, it happens. But we know that we have free will, right? You have free will, I have free will. So is it a commandment? Yes, but it's also a decision at the same time because we have free will to obey him or not to obey him like Adam and Eve had in the garden and they chose not to, right? And so we have that choice every day to follow him. And it's not easy. <laughs> follow me. Right. And so that's huge in our society today because, you know, Twitter, the idea is follow. Right. You follow each other. You follow this person. You follow that person. Um, and whoever you follow, you become. You become like your teachers. We become like our parents um, or grandparents, whoever raised you, whoever you follow on social media Whoever you follow or watch on a regular basis or whatever whatever is the most important to you, that is what you become. That's what you become. Whatever you pay attention to most, whatever comes out of your mouth the most, that is what you become. You become what you follow. And so Jesus says, follow me. Jesus being God in the flesh, follow me. Don't follow your pastor even though your pastor is hopefully following Christ, because we're going to make mistakes. Not everything we do is going to be perfect. No one other than Jesus is perfect. And a lot of pastors these days are falling away or going into some weird stuff. So don't follow your pastor necessarily. Don't follow your spouse because your spouse is flawed too. They'll make mistakes and they'll wander off the path too. We're all sheep here. Hear me out. And the next is uh, don't follow anybody. Don't follow a politician. Don't follow nobody except Jesus. Because Jesus says, if the blind lead the blind, if you follow blind people and the blind person falls into a ditch, you too will fall into a ditch. Let me give you a quick example. Someone says, hey, I'm going to go rob a bank. And let's you you follow me, right? Let's do it together. And then you follow them. And whether you are partaking or participating, you're guilty by association. And just like when Peter denied Christ, even though Christ was innocent, he wasn't robbing banks. He wasn't doing anything illegal. But because they were jealous of him, they wanted to kill him and anyone who belonged to him. But going back to the original analogy here, the analogy is if you follow a bank robber around, you're going to be guilty by association. It doesn't matter if the person isn't actually robbing the bank or not. Well, well people don't like you. Well, it does matter, but <laughs> hear me out here. Jesus is not a bank robber. Jesus is not committing sin, right? This, this analogy is a person obviously committing sin, right? But... There are consequences to both. There are consequences when you follow Jesus to do the right thing. And there are consequences when you do the wrong thing. Either way, there's consequences. And we live in a world that hates God, that hates Jesus. And so 
to one analogy, it's justifiable for someone to end up being killed for robbing a bank or uh, going to jail for a very long time. That's justifiable. That's understanding, right? However, in the Bible, in the Gospels, it's not understanding to kill a man who's innocent. Or no, nor his followers who are following him, who are also innocent because they're trying to imitate by following the leader's example. So Jesus says, follow me into your death. Follow me where people will hate you for no reason. Follow me where people will despise you and mock you and try to kill you. And you will eventually give your life up for me or not, right? And so did the disciples understand what they were getting into? I don't think so, because when it came to that time that Jesus was being handed over by the Pharisees, all the disciples, including Peter, of course, fled. One of them fled booty naked. I don't know which one that was, right? But they were, they were willing to find out. And so if you notice when Jesus finally first calls them, he calls them and things aren't as hard as they will they they will eventually get the same thing is true for us when i first started following jesus it was it was pretty good it was pretty good it was like oh well, eh? and then the more i follow jesus it's getting harder and harder and harder and i'm like oh my gosh i don't know how much i could take of this and then i start really thinking about it and jesus says count the cost count the cost is what you, if you really want to follow me it's going to cost you your life. And so you start to think about that, like, wow, Jesus is really asking for us to lay down our life for his message for him. He is the message, right? So let's move forward. Verse 44. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the t hometown of Andrew and Peter. Verse 40. That was 44, 45. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. And so did the prophets. Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Okay, there's a lot to uncover here. First thing is when you get saved, the first thing that you do is you want to tell everybody. That's normal. And honestly, in my opinion, as you grow in your faith, you should want to tell more people. Because Jesus says, go and preach the gospel to the ends of creation. So, they were already preaching the gospel before they even knew that they were told to preach the gospel. They're telling each other. They're telling their friends, their family, right? Their relatives. They're telling their coworkers. My question to you is, are you telling people about Jesus? Why not? We're all called to tell people about Jesus, right? And so I'm not going to get too far into that and scold you guys, but <laughs> tell People, we're called to tell people about Jesus, whether it's online, that's huge, right? You don't have to deal with people directly, right? <laughs> In some, most cases, um, or at your workplace, right? And don't be ashamed of your faith. And so they're telling one another they found the Messiah. Mind you, at this time, there were many different kinds of people who claimed to be the Messiah. Many. There are still people today that claim to be the Messiah. So how do they know? Well, I believe faith. Faith revealed who the real Messiah was, right? Who Moses wrote about in the law. So there, in this time, there were, there were multiple different interpretations. And I'm going to parallel this idea because this is a to hot topic lately in our day and age with the coming back of Christ and the first coming of Christ, which we're reading about right now. And so they said, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the, and the prophets. And interesting enough, here you have it in their day, just like today, people interpreted what the Messiah was going to be like, how he was going to come or what he was going to look like, all everything under the sun. Some people had a lot of uh, assumptions, and some people had little, um, but they knew the Messiah was going to come. 
like I said, some thought he was going to come this way and that way and all these other ways. And like I said, there were people who were claiming to be the Messiah and who led multiple people astray to their death, right? Because they were going against the Romans and they thought that the Messiah would come and fight against the Romans. And some claimed to be the Messiah and decided to fight against the Romans and were taken over. So it's it, and that, that's happening today. There are multiple people who claim to know the way to heaven or paradise in general. There are many claim to know how to save you from from debt or finances or whatever, save you from your marriage or whatever. And then there are flat out those who are claiming to be Jesus Christ himself or the Messiah or from different religions or whatever. And, and there's so many wrong interpretations of this. Just as it was in their day, it's happening in our day of what the Lord was going to be like, uh, who he would come through, when he would come, how he would come, all this stuff. is just, And the same thing is today. And we will parallel that with, with uh, Revelation, the second coming of Christ. And so they knew that there was going to be a first coming. Christ is the same word as Messiah, right? And so... We know that Jesus is coming back. Just as they knew that there was going to be a Messiah, we know that Jesus is coming back. And through time, we discerned which one was telling the truth and which one wasn't. Many have not uncovered which faith or interpretation of faith of according to the word of God is the right interpretation. And so the Pharisees had a whole different mindset from these people whom Jesus says, come and follow me. And my question to you is, how do you know you're following the real Christ or the real theology or the real um, message of the Lord? How do you know your theology is really coming from the spirit of God rather than the spirit of the flesh, which is man? Because I've heard so many interpretations according to the word of God. Many are good. Many, I believe, are from the Lord. But there's a lot more out there that are I don't believe are from the Lord. And, and, and they're reading from the same text. It's interesting, right? Um, many, many religious Pharisees we see today still just like their day. Uh, and, and they need to know everything. And, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But they become so obsessed that they miss the movement move of the spirit. And that happens a lot. Right. I have sure I've missed it, too. And so here comes the Messiah. And John says, this is the Messiah, this, the son of God, the savior of the world, takes away the sin of the world. Follow him. Right. And then just like their day, we have the same thing going on. People are saying, no, he's over here. No, he's over there. No, he's that. No, he's this. No, this is the right interpretation. So how you didn't know? God knows who belongs to him, I guess, right? So let's move on. So Revelation, how is Christ going to come back? I have no idea, but I believe that I will know when Jesus wants me to know and how it would look. And and, and, and the scriptures do, do say that. It says he's going to come from the sky and all that stuff. Um, I believe that. How is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? I have no idea. Let's move on into the text. Nazareth. Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Let me tell you some folks, I'm going to parallel this idea with where I live. I live in a small, danky town called Battle Mountain, Nevada. I never thought I would live here, but this is where I live. This is where Lord has us right, the Lord has us right now. Uh, we got out here because my, my, my mom, <laughs> my wife got a job here and then she got pregnant and then we've been here ever since. Um, she had pregnant. Now we've got four kids. So long story short, this town was named uh, the armpit of America. Like what? Like the, a really danky small town, 35 to 4,000 people max uh, on a good season, I guess. It is it is not a place that anyone that I would want anyone to live. But some people like it. Hey, not for me, but I'm here. And this is kind of what the idea is getting at here. This Nazareth is like a danky small town that nobody, nothing, even, even uh, I think it was Philip. He says, can anything good come? Was it Philip or Nathaniel? 
Nathaniel, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So this place is basically like the ghetto of all ghettos. And that's kind of how I feel about this place too. But God loves to turn what is bad into what is good. Turn what people despise into what people will praise one day. And that's exactly what he's doing, not just in this time and in this day. So he come, he's coming from the worst of the worst place that you could ever be. It's like be, saying today, oh, I'm from California or something like that, right? And most people just, just hate California. I don't think anything good comes out of there, right? And this is the idea here is Nazareth is the worst place in the world at that time, I have no idea, but definitely in the region of uh, Israel and all that stuff. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And God's like, anything good can come out of anything that I decided to. And I don't like how you guys are talking bad about anyone or anything that I've created. So I'm going to take the dark, the thing that you guys hate the most, the thing that you guys despise the most, human beings, and I'm going to glorify it. I'm going to lift it up. And those things that you guys praise the most and love the most, I'm going to bring that down. <laughs> so verse 46, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel, that was it, asked him, come and see, Philip answered. Think about this. This is the Messiah. This is Jesus. This is God. He's perfect. God comes out of the darkest places in the world. The places that are shamed, the, the people that are shamed. The, you know, and it's interesting because you got to look at his disciples too. Can anything, so this is Nathaniel saying, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, the thing about the Pharisees, they thought they were the best of the best. They thought they were, oh, um, you know, holier than thou. They thought they were untouchable. They thought they were the most amazing. They thought they were God themselves. And Nathaniel is kind of acting like a Pharisee. And God chooses the chooses what's in the trash. God chooses a place that is known as a garbage dump of a town, right? To be out of all the places in their time or even is like comparing today. What is probably one of the best places that you can claim today to be born into, right? Or a place you could be born, right? Or live, right? What is the best position that you could ever want to have in, in the world? God doesn't choose to come through the, through those places or to do his work. The first place that he chooses is the darkest slums of all the slum, slummy slumma. <laughs> I just made that up, but think about that. Think about that for your situation, right? Most celebrities, most famous people are not going to choose the unattractive, to choose the, the, the bottom of the barrel of society places. But that's not God. God chooses the places that are at the bottom of the barrel, and he chooses the people who are at the bottom of the barrel. So it's kind of funny that God is choosing Nathaniel, who's like, who's at the bottom of the barrel, and he's like, oh, I, he thinks he's at the top, I guess, right? <laughs> so... I just thought that was funny. Philip's answered, come and see. Verse 47, the Jews saw Nathaniel, uh, I'm sorry. Then Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said about him. Because <laughs> he's like, he, he heard that. I heard that. Even though you weren't here, I heard that. Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. So he's really saying Nathaniel is a guy that just, he just blurts out things. He's that guy that just says it for what it is. I can probably say I'm probably like Nathaniel. <laughs> I was just talking trash about him too, right? <laughs> and he's saying, this guy, Nathaniel, he tells the truth. Even when it hurts, even when it's uncomfortable. <laughs> and then Nathaniel says, how do you know me? I just met you. How do you know me? Before Philip called you, Jesus is saying, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Jesus answered. 
What was Nathaniel doing? The Chosen has an interpretation. He was weeping, his business failed, and he didn't know what to do, and he cried out to God, right? Isn't that interesting how Jesus shows up? He shows up and he knows like everything because he's God. He knows everything. He can predict the past and the future. This he's predicting the past, even though he wasn't present. Whatever Nathaniel was doing under the tree. <laughs> right? Before Philip called him. Jesus says to Peter, hey, you're going to deny me three times before it even happens. No, Knowing if Jesus, God told us the future, we'd be terrified, I think. Unless it was good, right? Interesting enough, he went to the cross knowing he was going to die. Most of us would try to avoid that, right? So he doesn't frighten us with that. He, he or, or Nathaniel here, he's like, I saw you under the fig tree. Maybe this fig tree was a private place. Maybe it was his prayer place. Maybe it was his place of doing things he shouldn't be doing. Who knows? But whatever reason, the first instance he says is, Rabbi, like he's like, you caught me or you saw me? Like he was so shocked. He probably thought nobody could see him. Like this is his sacred place. This is a place, whether he's doing something he's not supposed to do, whether it's just a place that nobody knows about. How do you know me? Nathaniel replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Some of us need great signs and wonders to believe. Some of us just need Jesus to say, yeah, I saw you doing that <laughs> to believe. And that's amazing about Nathaniel. He just believes right when he hears that. Whereas someone else believed through somebody else's testimony, which was John the Baptist. Right? Was it Philip? You hear what I'm saying? Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. He's talking to Nathaniel. You believe what I have to say. I'm going to show you greater things than this. And there's the key right there. Believing in Jesus and believing what he said, according to the word of God. Jesus says to Nicodemus, if you don't believe the words that I speak, which is your human language, and I use references from your, the created world that God has, that, that, that's around you. If you don't believe what I'm saying, referencing creation in your language, how could you believe if I tell you of heavenly things which cannot be referenced from anything in this physical creation God made that's completely beyond explaining? This is very interesting. This is very powerful here because this is kind of getting at the same thing. Nathaniel, and what is he asking for? He's asking for faith. God is always asking for faith. Hebrews says there's no way to please God unless by faith. There's no way to experience something greater unless you're experiencing it through faith. The most supernatural experiences I've ever had were unexplainable. There is no human language that I can use to describe what I experienced. And I've had those experiences over and over and over again. And there's some that I could try to explain and I've tried to tell other Christians that were supposed to be higher up in the church or whatever, or just Christians in general. And they're like, oh, I don't believe that. Because they're, they're stuck on reasoning. Now, there's nothing completely wrong with reasoning, but reasoning is more of a foundation to, to ignite faith. That's why the scripture says, faith comes by hearing 
and hearing by the word of God. Basically, when you're hearing the preaching of the word of God, it ignites your faith. It's like it starts a fire. The word of God is being, it's like starting a fire, right? If I take this, if this was two sticks, and it's like you're going, or, you know, you're doing one of those to start a fire. And it's sharpening. It's sharpening. The word is sharpening against the word until there's a spark. Boom. And that spark ignites your faith. And when your faith is ignited, then you move beyond reason into the unknown. And Jesus is saying to Nathaniel, you believed I spark I sp what I've said to you about the fig tree thing. I sparked your faith. I ignited your imagination, if I could say. I ignited your curiosity. I ignited your hope. I ignited your, I motivated you through through the word that I said to you. It, 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 Jesus, God spoke all things into creation. God created man and he spoke to his soul. And, 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 and Nathaniel heard his creator's voice. In other words, he heard it because he believed it. Many people hear the spirit of God, but they don't believe it. And so they never follow the voice. Neither do they understand. They say, seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. And believing is also understanding. And understanding is also revelation. Through what? Through faith. In order, to in order to see, in order to understand, in order to experience, you must, you must use the key of faith. It's, it's like if I gave you a key to a treasure chest and I said, hey, there's, there's just blessings in this thing. There's treasure in here. There's like, you know, everything good under the sun. And you never put it in the key lock and and open it, you never uncover what's inside of it. And that's the same thing. That's what the scriptures do. It says, hey, you have to open the door yourself. You have to open up the word yourself. You have to believe it first. And then as you believe it, as you insert your faith into the scriptures, into the treasure chest of the word of God, and you turn it over, fully believing it, in spite of understanding it, in spite of seeing it, in spite of knowing whatever, you activate it through faith. I'm going to believe the text in spite of I understand it, in spite of I seeing the signs or the miracles. I'm going to believe. And therefore, as you believe, the treasure is opened. Understanding is given. A new reality is is overtakes you. And then you're transformed. And then you begin to have heavenly experiences. But you can't have heavenly experiences if you don't believe. There's there's you're either in or you're out. There's no half faith. There's either you believe, you turn the key, boom, miracles, boom, new reality, boom, understanding, boom. God reveals himself because you believe. You don't, it's not, let me get enough understanding first. Let me get enough um, belief first. Let me do something else. And then, and then I'll believe when I see it. Then I'll believe when I understand it. Nope, that's not how it works. It's you believe and then you understand it. And then you see it. Then you experience it. It's not you experience it, see it. You must experience it and see it. And then you must touch it, touch it, taste it, and then understand it before you believe. No, you believe and then you understand and then you experience and then you know. And Jesus said something that ignited his faith. And what was it? He spoke the word. And Nathaniel believed. Like I said, the word of God is being preached all the time. The treasure chest is right in front of people's faces. When the word of God is preached, the treasure chest is right there. And they go, how do I know there's treasure in there? 
You got to activate it. What do you mean? You got to believe it. You got to believe there's treasure chests in there, treasure in there. And if you don't believe there's treasure in there, you'll never open it. And so they're trying to pick the lock. They're trying to get through and find another way in and da da da. da but they don't want to believe. And it's only the do the key it only opens to faith. That's it. The key to your freedom, the key to experiencing God, the key to the eternity, the key is always activated through faith. It, there's no other way to open the, 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 the treasure chest or the door. It's sealed until you fully believe. And then when you fully believe, the treasure just bursts out or you go into it and whatever, right? And so it's interesting watching so many scholars and theologians these days trying to find another way in by understanding enough before they put their faith into what God said. I've seen it all the time. And I go, wow, you can be found, but you're really lost at the same time. <laughs> You can, Jesus said it. He said, you look at the scriptures thinking you'll find eternal life, but I tell you, they point to me. And he even says that many will say to me on the last day, didn't we do this and that? Didn't we understand and memorize scripture? He's like, yeah, you did all that, but you didn't believe. You didn't really believe what it said. You didn't really believe in me. And then he says to them, I never knew you. And Jesus says, you call me Lord, Lord, then why don't you do what I say? Because doing what he, he says means you believe what he said. And to not do what he says means you don't believe what he said. You memorized it, but you didn't do it. <laughs> and so there you have it. That's all I really got for you guys. Um, and so Jesus, for those who blessed are those who believe without seeing part of seeing is understanding god is not asking for our understanding he's not asking for us to see anything he's asking us to just trust blessed are you who believe without seeing amen and i'll confess i said to god before i got saved unless i see you i won't believe i was uh doubting thomas yeah and then he revealed himself and then i believed and he even said it to me when he first met me, or he knew me, but he said it to me. He's like, you won't believe unless you see. <laughs> and so I'll show you. And then since then, I've I've still struggled, but I'm believing. <laughs> Amen. Um, and then I've seen greater signs. And I go, wow. Faith opens the door to heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Bless us, guide them, and give them faith to believe in you, your word, so that you may pour out a blessing upon them. In Jesus' name, amen, and God bless.